What's going on, Hot Take of the Day listeners? DRW here. Before we want to, before we start the show, I want to start with a thank you to one of the friends of the show and take a quick minute to introduce API Control Systems, who specializes in control panel fabrication, skid package automation, and instrumentation and electrical installations for the oil and gas industry, as well as other industries. During a recent show with well-known CEO, he said that when companies try to do too many things, it's very rare that they're successful. And in the words of Mr. Chris Wright, if you're going to be really good at something, you better be deeply focused on it. Well, for over three decades, API has been focused on building control panels such as PLC panels for compressor stations, hydraulic well control systems, drilling choke consoles, and skid package automation such as hydraulic power and chemical inj injection skids for deep water projects, and safely installing them. As you know, my sign off, be safe, be good. Safety is always first. Whether electronic, hydraulic, pneumatic, they have the expertise and enthusiasm with their hardworking team. API has a great culture and a lot of longtime employees. They're responsive and they partner with a wide variety of companies from the super majors down to local municipalities. Last year, two longtime employees acquired the company, having started there at entry level positions over 20 years ago, which is a cool example of patience, perseverance, and the American dream. If you want to learn more about API, please go to apicontrolsystems.com and consider giving this fun team a shot at your next panel fabrication or INE installation project. They're based in Louisiana, they're ready to travel, and again, their website is apicontrolsystems.com. Contact information is there, and when you ask for them, ask for Lucas Como and tell him you want the hot take of the day DRW discount. Thanks for listening. Now on with our show. What is going on, Hot Take Nation? It is DRW here for another episode of the Hot Take of the Day podcast. And I am very excited. I'm always excited. Everybody who listens knows I'm excited about pretty much everything. But I'm, I am exceptionally excited this week because my ex-colleague from many, many, many years ago at Anadarko, Clay Gaspar of WPX, the president and COO, is joining us for a chat today. And we have a lot to cover. Clay, how are you? I'm doing great. Thank you for the invite. I look forward to it is really today. It's been a little while. It has been a really like so. So let's start with you um, before we even get into the WPX Felix acquisition and what that did to transform WPX's position, the Devon WPX deal, and then some of the M and A we've seen before. Why don't you give our listeners who may not be as familiar with you your background and sort of start with maybe Anadarko and then and then come to where you are today. Give us a little intro. Yeah, so Anadarko was, you know, the bulk of my career, probably 16 years uh, of my 25 or so. And, um, you know, kind of where I had some of the most incredible mentors along the way. Got to see us do some things right, some things wrong, uh, learn from both. But, you know, incredibly, I had some great opportunities to, to have some real diverse experiences, uh, but also be kind of tucked in by some of the leaders and kind of got to see a little bit behind the scenes of, of some of the the things and why we did what we did. And it was just, it was an incredible experience. And I'll always, always be appreciative of to those, to those folks on uh, how much mentoring I had along the way. Now, do you remember where you were when you found out that Anadarko was buying Kermagee and, and, and Western gas? Yeah. Yeah. So that was an amazingly tightly held secret. I think there were very few people inside of, of Anadarko that knew. And to the best of my knowledge, no one in Kermagee knew about Western. No one in Western knew about Kermagee. So to pull off, uh, you know, the one-two punch, uh, $25 billion worth of transactions. And, and by the way, it was a all cash. We'll figure out how to pay for it later deal. Yeah, one-year revolver. I could not. I mean, when you look back on that, the, the fact that Al Walker was able to put a one-year revolver for $25 billion in place to do a cash deal. We'll figure out how to pay for it later. You know, it, it was it was an incredibly bold, may I say bold, move. And and you know, really looking back on it now having a little bit more scale and scope and, and reflection on it, uh, it was the right, absolute right thing for, for all three parties involved. And uh it was tough. I mean I, I remember the, 
the subsequent couple of years of grinding and really trying to come together. Um, integration is difficult. Acquisition is difficult. The true integration and mergers are, are exceptionally difficult. Uh, we're facing some of the same challenges ahead. I mean, we've done several acquisitions along the way. As you mentioned, Felix, Panther, RKI, you know, and those are very much, okay, here's our systems, here's our processes. We're going to try and learn along the way. But 90 plus percent of the time, we're going to default back to what we know. I think with this unique situation, it's this mergers of, merger of equals, we're really kind of looking at, e- at each other saying, okay, how do you do this? How do you do that? What do we think is going to be the best of organizationally, structurally, processes, technology, people, all of those come together and it, it becomes exponentially more difficult to get it right. But we are emphatic that um, we're going to do whatever it takes to make sure that we get it right. Yeah, and, and, and it's it's interesting that you raise that because even, even I had forgot about the Panther and RKI acquisitions. They really pivoted WPX from what it was, and and when I was at Enterplus, obviously WPX was a competitor on the Fort Berthold Indian Reservation, and so with those acquisitions, and I would include Felix in that, those were asset acquisitions. Yes. And and you guys obviously are, are good at integrating those, and and you know that in March when when the the rumor broke on the weekend that that you guys were taking down Felix, and then I think it came out either the Sunday night or the Monday. But I was very very much in favor of that transaction because you know there was a cash element, but there was a share element. They had a really core, excellent Delaware position that was really concentrated. But you guys are really good at asset acquisitions. How do you compare that? versus what you're doing with Devin, because not only are you merger of equals, but you're merging some of the boards and some of the teams and some of the systems and some of the process. So compare and contrast them and tell me about the challenges and then how you're going to solve some of those social issues. I think both on the Devin side and the WPX side, we've done some good acquisitions, kind of hold-ins, even some large deals. I think back on Devin, Geo Southern, very large, big, big deal. Um, but that was really a tuck-in, you know, fit into our databases, our systems, and our processes. And I don't have any insight knowledge of it, but I would certainly expect that Devin was also on the hunt to find what does Geo Southern really do that we can adopt. Uh, we had that attitude going in with Felix, and I can tell you right off the bat, we adopted some of their facility designs, not just in the Felix assets, but we exported to the state line assets and even took some things up to North Dakota. And then we were able to take some of the best of techniques from North Dakota, apply it to our Felix assets, and and I think that's a real win. As you mentioned, with the Devon situation, we're looking to everything, big systems. I mean, our fundamental systems, they use PEEP as their uh, economics reserves, uh, economic database. We use ARIES. Um, you know, Did you just say, I, I, I don't mean to make fun of it. For those who still work at Peep, I didn't know Peep still existed, if I'm totally honest. Aries was like sort of abacuses and, and, and things to, to call Aries, that thing together. I 3.0 and Peep might even be before that. But but nonetheless, just an example. And, and they self-aware, they get it, they're ready to, to turn the page and look for the next opportunity. Maybe it's Aries, maybe it's something else. And so just as something as, as fundamental as how we run our economics, we're currently evaluating what's the best, best path forward. And, and that's, you know, times many, many dozens of systems. Um, needless to say, all the organizational structure, they move from more of a functional organization to a team's organization. We move, move from a team's organization to a functional organization not too long ago. Not because one's better than the other. I, I believe in change and disruption and moving people's shoes a little bit so that they can just kind of see things again for the first time and go after and improve and uh, set new bars. I think we all have shelf lives in our in our careers and our positions. And if you don't, if you're not taken out of your comfort zone and shaken up, complacency can set in, and then you know things just start falling apart. Uh, when you went from the functional to team, if I if I heard that correctly, what, what was the? I agree with you. I think the disruption causes change and, and instability that, that maybe you don't rest on your laurels so much. What 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 occurred, I guess, in the operations that, that you would say really helped push the business forward? Because as you said, I, I know Felix was really pushing the envelope on some of these um, frack spreads on multi pads and some of their facility design and some of the technology. So as you move to that, what what technology advancements did you did you benefit from? 
Yeah, so I, I heard two questions. If I didn't hear it correct, let me know. But the first thing is why move from teams to functional? In our case, it was pretty unique. We had uh, the Permian that was very large, very, very deep inventory, and then the Williston, very large in the production sense, but waning on the on the amount of inventory and opportunity ahead. Uh, as we saw, you know, as we pushed more investment into Permian, that asset kept growing. As we did more bolt-ons, as our land teams did these amazing trades, it just kept kind of growing and bolstering that position. Meanwhile, in Williston, it's almost waning because you're drilling that precious inventory every single day. You compound that with the Felix acquisition, and now we might have been like this before. It just it moved exceptionally different. And so instead of trying to have a, a varsity and a junior varsity team or something that was viewed from that, because if you're not on the huge team, then uh, what does that mean for me? Um, we said, look, we can do this a million, million different ways. There is no single solution to organization. Um, it's about the people. It's about the leadership. It's about the communication. And so we said, let's try something different. We evaluated different hybrid approaches. And what we ended up with was uh, one leader that that runs the production fuel organization, which, by the way, is a huge piece of our business and a huge part of the go forward organization. If you're thinking about base declines and lease operating expense and all the opportunity we have there. And then you have another leader that is kind of the subsurface, more planning, geoscience, reservoir engineering, a little bit more strategy, a little bit more forward thinking. And then you have a DNC facilities type leader that runs. They're the capital folks that are really um, managing the, the billion dollars or so that we're investing on an annual basis. And, uh, and then of course the, we were before functionally around land, midstream marketing, environmental health and safety and, and on and on. Okay. I mean that it, 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 it's, it actually makes a lot of sense. I love your description of the JV versus not. And, and what we've seen this week with really just the perception of that. Clearly I didn't think of, you know, anybody that was on one team as inferior to the other. But you know the feel. If you're not getting one team's getting eighty percent of the capital, you know they've got the spotlight and they've got all the yeah. you know the fun that comes with that. Yeah, yeah, no, I I love that because I mean I know that you would remember when we were at Anadarko and I tell this story all the time. But you know the Kerr McGee acquisition was done to make us the premier onshore natural gas company, and one of the key assets that we bought was the Greater Natural Buttes asset. Now, you flash forward to the way gas actually played out from basically 2008 to now. Anadarko slash Oxy has divested that asset, you know, and, and I remember um, there was a, maybe an unfair characterization. But if you got moved to the Wattenberg asset as an engineer, you were basically being sent there to die because you were doing like second fracks and tertiary fracks and refracts and re-refracts and, and nothing was going on. And I remember Brad Johnson at the time, who's now over at Ultra, obviously, as the CEO. And Brad got moved over there and said, we're trying this horizontal well. And like the, the initial results look actually really good. And I was like, Wattenberg? And so it went from this asset that, you know, became the the growth. It was everything. And so I love your model. If you have the best people working everything and yes. there's no there's no concerns about, well, I'm on this or I'm on that, or you get the best from everyone. So that totally makes sense to me as a functional organization. And and so Devin was functional and they went to team. Is that right? Yeah, it was a different modification of a, of a functional, but they are more asset team now. And, you know, go forward. We're not sure which way it's going to go. I think I am not clearly not led to one model or another. Mm -hmm. I love the idea of disruption. I love the idea of a fresh set of eyes on assets or the way we do things. The blending of, uh, of teams and blending of leadership. Uh, as I think the Anadarko and Kermit Gee folks did a really good job of, of that in many ways. Um, I think that's much more important than than where we sit on an organizational chart. And then, you know, there's, there's bridges, there's co-locations, a magical piece of business, you know, how, you know, the dotted line and how those function. I can tell you right now that the guy in the next office to me doesn't report to me, he reports to the CFO. He's our, our VP of planning, but he sits next to me for a reason. I hear what he's doing. He hears what I'm doing. We are hundred percent on the same page. He attends my, my, my weekly leadership meeting any off sites or anything we do, we come together he is like tucked in tight because I need that openness and transparency. So he sees everything that is going on. When there's a bump in the road. He's aware of it immediately as soon as I am. And then vice versa. I don't want him planning and 
creating something that is not operationally logical either. So, you know, I think it's a, it's a solution that we found, you know, okay, however folks report, that's one thing, where they sit, um, wh- how they function in their day to day life is the kind of the supplements to bring that, that communication together and at all costs trying to avoid those, the siloing that can happen in any organization. Yeah. So, so I, I'm glad that you raised that because you sort of, you alluded to it. And, and when I have Vicki Holub on the podcast about two months ago, you know, we'd obviously COVID and we're going to talk about COVID in the context of oil and gas, but, um, you know, a lot of companies went to work from home and operating rigs and running fracks and actually running the, we were an essential service, but you're kind of building the plane as it's flying. And yeah. At the same time, all your employees were home. And as I recall, you closed Felix like March 8th and the lockdowns, et cetera, were kind of like March 20th. So now you're trying to integrate an asset when your people aren't there. Now you've announced this massive two company combination. How are you thinking about work from home and flexibility and the transition from where we were to where you're going in the context of all the change that's happening in your organization? Well, I, I think like so many things, I think when you really are, take a critical eye and look at it, there's amazing things that have come from it. I mean, our comfort um, culturally uh, with video conferencing is, is significantly improved. I'm a huge fan, and I think I've seen that uh, across the board. You think of the, the way our organizations typically work, uh, the engineers are in some central office and the field guys are you know closer to the wells, and you've got that separation, and that distance, and you're trying to communicate even via phone or text or, you know, there's just that gap. Video is a great bridge in that regard. Um, I, I had the same thoughts as many of my peers when, let's fast forward to, from March 13th or 20th to the 27th and into April. It's like, wow, this is really working. I tell you, it's, you know, the, it's amazing how well, how we can function and we haven't missed a beat. Um, what I was listening for and, and, and eventually, you can see is we were able to keep that momentum going because everyone was 100% clear on this is what's critically important. We need to make sure the rigs are running. We need to make sure the w- the wells are running. There's got safety protocols and environmental protocols, and we're just going to focus on that to really drive through this. But where is that? I just happened over here a conversation down the hall, and I've got some experience from from 10 years ago. I'm going to go insert myself into that conversation and, and really supercharge that conversation or head something off that, you know, could be a waste of time. Those are the things that, that really struggle when you just don't have proximity. Um, I'm a believer that, I mean, just a separation from one floor to the next. Um, we've seen it before. It's amazing how that communication falls. Yeah. You know, in offices, we have a building here. There's multiple elevator banks. That elevator bank separation is is an amazing separation. Then you think about some companies have multiple buildings or maybe multiple campuses, even in the same city, it's like a whole different world. And so I think we, while I was as guilty as anyone about being excited about the being able to function remotely, there are there are massive uh, negatives to that as well. And I think some of the things that that we see play out over time. You know, who's thinking two years and five years down the line? and Who's got that breakthrough, that that happened conversation that over coffee, you know, that morning even planning on bringing that person into the loop. But, hey, since you're here, come on in and let's talk about it. And all of a sudden they are the center of the conversation. So um, we'll, we'll see how things play out. It's going to be tough. Uh, we have to be very thoughtful about, you know, how we it, just getting to know folks on the other side of the turnpike there. Uh, Oklahoma City, the Tulsa Turnpike is is a little bit challenging when you're trying to be socially distant and, and appropriate about um, exposure and those things. So it, it'll be one more challenge, but, um, you know, there's so many other challenges on the list about getting this right that it's just one of the things that we'll have to be thoughtful about. And I think you make a really good point that um, I loved your elevator bank because I think everyone who's worked in this industry or any industry they they feel that and you know how many times have we done a reshuffle of a building where you're restacking floors or you're changing teams and it's all about communication and you're right it felt like 
as long as you were doing sort of the same thing, but if you were trying to integrate a new company, integrate a new asset, integrate the culture, and honestly, if I was a two or three year engineer that didn't get exposure to you in a meeting, like our old QBRs at Anadarko, you know, those were an opportunity for 60 or 80 people who were leaders and future leaders in the company to all be in the same room and and be present and 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 hear from all the different leadership. So so I'm I'm glad to hear you say that because because it does seem like our industry and just every industry would would lose a lot from being constantly home. So we are we are an amazing geologic leader along the way. He moved to Tulsa midst of COVID, joined the organization midst of COVID, as a new team in the midst of COVID, and he's trying to impact culture and impact technically how we do things and i mean it's like both hands tied behind his back he was so happy to finally see his team three-dimensionally and be able to just really have sit down look over maps and 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 get together in a way that is just it, it, virtual is a good proximity but it's it's no replacement and you think about that you mentioned that the younger uh, generation that's joined this all the time and how do they get that that regular mentoring, um, just go down the hall and hey, I'm stuck on this. Who's in their office? Oh, hey, can can I get five minutes? Sure, come on in. Uh, that's much harder to do, especially if you don't know, don't have that relationship already uh, kind of pre-programmed. Yeah, let's let's talk about technology. Um, as the, as the CEO of a substantial and getting more substantial. Uh, oil company, oil and gas, and also having seen over the course of your career as I did in my career, the progression of, of everything we've done, the fracking and um, proper foot, lateral lengths, distance, clean out, slow back, not. Talk to me about what you see as the, the future of technology in the next year. And again, I think a lot of our listeners sort of ask, well, if shale, if, sh if the shale model isn't working as well, what technology can help unlock it? So from your seat, what are you seeing as the next year of technological innovation? Or is it just capital control and reduction and efficiency that gets us to the next level? I think it's an interesting question because I, I personally don't believe it's the shale model that has been broken. <coughs> Excuse me. I think it's the business model that's been broken. I think investing 130, 140% of cash flow every single year, foreseeable future, that is just not sustainable. And that's just a simple math problem. Um, I think the shale model, as I think about it, is, you know, you think about concentric circles. You think about the, the very core where a really good operator that's very, that's very focused on cost control and operations should be able to make a very solid return all the way to the bottom line in this asset given a reasonable commodity price. And then you think about that next concentric circle, one ring wider, where it just gets a little bit more difficult. Maybe the next ring wider it gets that much more difficult. And now only the very best operators are really able to play in that space, or maybe in an inflated commodity price, they can play in that space. Then you think of the wider and wider concentric circles where we really shouldn't be messing with until there's some incredible demand that that drives commodity price way beyond what we're seeing today. And so I think having the discipline to say, okay, we're only going to focus in this area. Um, you know, one of the best things that happens that is happening to this industry is um, the requirement around our capital investment and the constraint around capital investment it causes a natural high grading. And so as we think about our incredible opportunity set, our full portfolio, and you think, okay, I could invest $3 billion and, and feel good about a return. But what if it's only $2 billion? What if it's only $1 billion? What if you're squeezed further than that? What would you invest in? That natural high grading makes us better. So I think the business model is where we have fallen short, short as an industry. Um, I think, I mean, I see us drilling wells today. The wells that are coming online, they are phenomenal. There's some, they're better than some of the offshore wells I worked in many of the offshore wells, wells I worked in years past. Um, and so I, I, I don't think it's a, a necessarily a, a broken U.S. onshore shale model. I think that model still holds. We just have to be very disciplined. And uh, when there's not a, a hard line fault block difference, like in the offshore world, 
there's good reservoir and then there's no reservoir. Shale is this, this world of concentric circles where it's really good rock, relatively speaking, really good rock, and then lesser and lesser and lesser. And for the folks out on the edges, you know, magic has to happen for that really to be able to uh, deliver a return to the very bottom line. Well, and you're certainly seeing that with this week's announcement of, of Concho being acquired by Conoco. And and again, I think socially, it's very interesting that Conoco is having Tim Leach become the leader of the lower 48. And then yeah. in the case of uh, Pioneer and Parsley, which they announced yesterday, uh, I think Matt Gallagher is going to join the board. And so there is a level of, of more integration, which again, I know we talked about before on camera, but it really reminds me of the anadarko Kerr McGee merger where you know we were trying to get more onshore gas and certainly for Conoco and Pioneer, they're trying to get more Permian. And so Chuck Malloy took over as COO and a lot of the people who had been running those core assets took major leadership roles. So it'll be interesting as, as you guys, so, so without commenting specifically, but there's a WPX culture, there's a Devon culture, there's a turnpike between the two office buildings, and then there's some asset overlap and some not asset overlap, and it's overlaid by COVID where we can't have a town hall like we used to with a thousand people and have a barbecue. How do you get the teams and, and collaborate and share knowledge and, and, and high grade and, and get the team functioning as a leader in that organization? Well, that, therein lies the challenge. Um, I wish I had a, a snappy one, two, three kind of answer, but I think the real answer is it's going to take a tremendous amount of effort from both sides. I think our board has set the tone. Uh, having a blended board. Next, our executive team has a blended executive team. I fully expect the next level and the levels after that to be similarly blended. And that doesn't pre-describe that it's a 60-40 or a, a 90-10 or any of those things. But we're really looking for the ultimately the best players that can yield the best team. Um, it may not be, um, you know, you don't want a bunch of ball hogs in the team, even though they may be exceptional athletes. Unless it's LeBron. You get LeBron on any team and you, you, will, take, you will, will win the world championship. That's all there is to it. <laughs> Clearly. Um, you know, Russell, Russell Westbrook, maybe there's a, you know, a little analogy there as a, you know, you don't need five of those guys in the same team, but an incredible athlete and, you know, somebody that, um, would be complimentary to almost any team he went to. Um, so I, I think that's that's the tricky part. We really need to figure out how do you blend um, those cultures. I, I personally think you mentioned culture. It's huge. It's top of my list of things we have to get right. But I also believe that um, an executive, especially a, a guy that's so devoted to, to building culture, is probably the worst person to ask, tell me about your culture. I mean, how does it work? Right. Uh, I just spent a couple of days out in the field and I'm listening for cultural clues. Uh, from my field organization, because that's what tells me about my culture. When I can walk in and rub a guy's bald head and go, hey, bud, how you doing? And he's, hey, Clay, and he gets back to work, middle of his conversation. That's awesome. That makes me feel like this is not, people don't freak uh, about maybe an executive coming into a field office. It's just kind of, hey, he's just one of the folks, and he's got his job, I've got my job, and um you know, we ha I had an HR guy with me uh, who's an exceptionally good and very welcome part of the organization. And when he walked in, I was kind of watching, you know, for their reactions, like, oh, crap, HR's here. Right. You know, there's got to be layoffs. There's got to be this. There's got to be. No, he's just, you know, somebody's just checking in and there to answer questions and kind of take pulse of what's going on and see how he can help. And to me, those are the best indications of culture to me um, rather than. You know, words we put on a page or on our website, uh, even though I work very hard and have a tremendous amount of passion about those things, it's really about kind of, uh, and, and service providers. You know, I love to get a view, an independent view of, of that perspective because I can tell you that these folks know if they want to work with your company or not. If your supply chain is, makes them do 75 backflips and fill everything out and triple it before they can even bid, it's like, it's not even worth it. If you're going to, you know, pay me slow and negotiate, you know, just grill me on every single penny. It's just not worth it. And we, we lose in that situation. Um, you think about the, you know, the efficiency, the operations. Uh, once again, the service providers want to work with operators that are good because they make more money 
when that operator is efficient. It's just a symbiotic relationship, and we want to be uh, the welcome uh, serve, uh, partner in that regard. So, so you talk about field operations, and, and I love I love being able to pivot into that conversation because as we've seen technology, and and we talk about video. It's so easy for people now to communicate. Whereas when we were younger in our career, we would do everything on the phone and cell service wouldn't be good. And, and now we have access. How do you think um, the efficiency is going to improve? Because one of the comments people say about Zoom is they can be way more productive because there's never travel time between meetings. So instead yeah. of flying to Dallas for a two-hour meeting, spending two hours at the airport, travel two hours back, you have one meeting. Now you can hit off seven meetings a day. And for the field operator who is in front of a windshield, driving from well to well to well to well, how do you see technology and the evolution of efficiency and, and cost structure impact our ability to operate better? I know that's been a big challenge in our industry for the last 10 years. I'm curious if it, how it evolves. Uh, I'm, I'm a huge fan of it. And I think Devin is as well. You know, They have a, a, a combined uh, inter, uh, information technology and also innovation team. And they have an operations person that leads that, that organization. We've taken a little different approach. We have an existing information technology team, but we've supplemented it with an innovation team that reports to operations. And these, it's a very small group, but very focused on driving technological improvement into the core of the business. And that can be in a field, it could be in reserves analysis, it could be in something we're doing down hole, however that works, however that manifests. And it's been a huge win. We are, we are making very significant movements. I, I think most of it revolves around data. Uh, I was just listening to, to plug another podcast, Business Wars. I don't know if you ever listened to that. I haven't heard it. Oh my goodness, man. There's a Netflix versus, um, blockbuster business wars and they go through and kind of the history of the companies and how they faced off and, uh, Reed Hastings, the CEO of Netflix, they kind of get into, you know, years later into his mind, what was he thinking at different points? And the biggest separation was his identification that data was the key. Blockbuster at one time had replicated Net Netflix's website, had replicated their ability to distribute DVDs it's when they were mailing out DVDs. But what they completely missed on was that Netflix knew when I pulled up the Netflix website, it had all of my favorite kind of movies. Your front end would look entirely different and somebody else is entirely different. And Blockbuster could never get their head around that. So I think that piece, that data accessibility and, and look, the information, the communication that we're having is data as well. That real time immediate access to, to that information makes us better, whoever we are in the organization and, and less just driving two hours to get to that data. And so I think back on. Years and years ago, I remember visiting one of my favorite lease operators, an exceptionally capable guy, and his job at the time was to drive around, open up, it was a glass jar, and he'd stick his fingers in, he'd grab, and it was the, the run ticket from the water truck drive. Then he would drive 30 minutes and grab another ticket. And he made this kind of milk run to go pick up these pieces of paper, and then at the end of the day, he would type them into the system. I mean, you think about the capability, so this is a 25-year guy, the capability that was not being utilized by asking this guy to do this milk run, now all of that stuff's immediately scanned in. It goes straight into the system, and then that person is freed up to look and say, okay, how do I make my wells, be my wells better, my LOE better? How do I squeeze a little bit more value out of this, this opportunity? Right. Well, before we leave the field, slow back or fast back? Um, and and I, I always love – I love this because – it's so perfect an example of that the science isn't resolved because everyone can look at data in a different way and have different philosophies. I'm curious what your philosophy of, of flowback is and yep. if it's different than Devin and then how you would come together and, and resolve that. Uh, answer is both. And it's, uh, it's very interesting. I, I love the question as well because to me, if your mindset is that there's a single right answer, you're, you're probably missing it. And so the attributes of slowback, especially what we bought from Felix, they were outperforming everyone in that area. You could just plot it up over a 20. You didn't see it in the first three to six months, but you'd see it in 12, 24, 36 months, just them continuing to outrun the flatter curve. 
Um, so that, that was evidence to us that there's something to it. Now, is it, is it geo, geochemical? Is it geomechanical? Is there something else maybe at the surface that's unique that's causing this? So we've done some parallel tests. What we did not do is say, okay, Felix, you're the small guy. We're the big guy. We're going to use our technique. I don't care what you say. We went in and said, look, there's a bunch of smart people here and they were very impressive in many things they did. Said, okay, we're going to go head, head to head, same pattern, we're going to do a couple of different ways. And what we're finding is there's attributes to both. One of the things we're testing right now is very aggressive flowbacks to clear out some of the fraxin. We've all migrated to local sand, under mesh. One of the challenges with that sand is when it flows back, I mean, it continues to flow back and you've got separator issues, you've got uh, erosion and corrosion issues and just a lot of problems for our production side of the house. And so what we're, what we're evaluating now and having some, some excitement around is very aggressive flowbacks, at least to get that sand cleaned up. And then you start thinking a little bit more about your geomechanical and geochemical and how that flows out over time. You've always got to be concerned about the economics. How big of facilities do you, do you build? How much water takeaway do you have? You know, watching all the emissions and making sure that you're being very thoughtful about all those things. And so it's an interesting balance. And, and I'm happy to report say we are not singularly mindset on, on any particular way. How have you responded? I, I, and again, the facility, I love that you keep saying all the things that I, I think are great questions. The facility design is fascinating. And I know when we were at One Energy, um, before we sold, we were, we were building single well facilities because it didn't make sense for us to have a 12. But I know Devin has built these, you know, going to their IR presentation, but like $10 million facilities to bring on 10 wells at 2,000 barrels a day that have 80% declines. So peak day one is 20,000 barrels a day. So you have to build pipe to move 20,000 barrels a day. You need electricity, you need water capacity, you need gas capacity. And then, you know, a year on, your facility's overbuilt by 90%. How do you balance, especially with commodity prices going 60, 40, 30, zero, yeah. minus 40, how do you balance the right size facility and how are you thinking about facility design differently go forward for the next three to five years? So most of the fields that you and I have worked in the past, you get in, you drill all the wells and then you leave and you're never coming back. Uniquely, especially in the Delaware Basin, a year or two later, you're coming back and drilling all fresh wells. So I personally think what we're trying to, we're always trying to evolve, what we've migrated towards is building the right size facilities and maybe even having that latitude to build really big facilities so you can aggressively flow these wells back, improve the economics, improve the return, get that cash register ringing. And then say a year later, the wells are down. Now you are using only 25% of the capacity. Well, why couldn't you build small facilities, a duplication of those facilities for the old wells? And then you go to redrill the next six or 10 or 12 wells, whatever it is, they take on the big facilities. And then the, the old wells obviously take the, the, new, the new smaller facilities. So I think there's some opportunity like that when you have so many well, so many landing zones that you can afford to invest a little bit stronger in, uh, into the facilities. Um, the other thing is we want to be exceptionally thoughtful about ESG and making sure that we're not, um, Trying to be too penny wise, um, you know, on the on the design and having upsets and not being able to handle uh, the gas and having to cause flaring, those kind of things. Um, we know all too well today that it's worth investing right from the beginning to make sure that we have um, the right design. We're we're doing retrofits, even Felix, who I've just bragged about so much. We're doing retrofits on some of their designs uh, in regards to the to the emissions that didn't meet our standard coming in. So we're upping that and um, and doing some things that I think are, are very good, solid investments. So 18 months ago, it was all parent-child and, and Tudor Pickering had come out with a report. And I think that they were the first bank who had, who had raised it, obviously inside the industry. We knew and we've always been testing spacing. As you think about your development units and your development pods, when, you, when you're talking about infilling, I assume, are you drilling everything in the same zone and then coming back up to the Avalon, for example, or how are you staging your, your development and parent child and what thinking has evolved as we've studied this problem over the last 12 to 18 months? I, I personally think the right state of the art for us is uh, coming in drilling on the order of maybe six wells, maybe eight wells, possibly even four, but 
in that in that range of six wells, and you're concentrating on one flow unit. So in, in the in the state line area, it might be the upper wolf camp, and so that is the upper and lower wolf camp A, and maybe the X Y. We know that they are hydraulically con- connected. We know that if you just hit an upper A and then try and come back a year later and get the lower A, there is no getting it. It's gone. Mm. And so really concentrating on what is in true hydraulic communication, that flow unit, taking a slice. You won't be able to do the whole um, landing zone, the whole DSU, but maybe a quarter or a third of it. And then in a reasonable time, say six to nine months later, coming in right next door and then hitting that same uh, flow unit, just a little bit X, Y laterally from it before that the pressure sink allows to go real far uh, into that to that next zone, or excuse me, the next landing area. And then maybe a third visit, and then you've got that uh, that landing zone fully developed. Um, maybe you can do it in two visits. Maybe, you, um, you know, maybe it takes three or possibly even four, depending on how many wells you're willing to bite off at a time. Then, you come back in, and we've got uh, two or three landing zones in the in the third bone spring. We we know without a doubt that they are hydraulically independent from the upper bones, the upper wolf camp. Okay. Mm-hmm. So the upper wolf camp, um, the the lower. Let me just clarify because some people will raise a flag in that the lowermost third bone is hydraulically communicated with the X Y. What I'm talking about is kind of the upper portions of the third bone spring. Because it's a thick, it's a thick sand across your yeah, whole it's position. Six thousand feet, and you're you have a lot of room in there. What I'm talking about is the landing zones that are clearly independent. You can come in and hit those. We've got a, tremendous results in the second bone that are also uh, another development, and then we've got another uh, a little bit higher gas cut down into the C's and D's, possibly even the B's that are at least one more flow unit and maybe beyond that. So. Again, you're revisiting time and time again, and the first few have similar uh, oil cuts. So facility designs and all that should be very consistent. Clearly, when you come back with the Ds, you might need to tweak things along the way. Um, but that's how we think about it is kind of what's hydraulically connected. Make sure we hit that. But we don't want to partially deplete a zone and then try and come back in later. We've learned that from experience. So it just doesn't work. And um, and I think that's so far it's been the right approach. So how so you mentioned earlier in the conversation that the the VP of planning sits next to you and mm-hmm. and then we talked about capital constraints and now we've just talked about the number of wells and and what the iteration so three billion versus two billion versus one billion in terms of offsets and parent childs and how you stack how, how sophisticated is the planning process and how much has it changed you know if you think about twenty twenty I mean. You went into 2020, oil was 63. We'd assassinated an Iranian general. It was looking really good. Then you closed your Felix transaction. Your stock was up to 14 bucks. The market loved it. Then COVID hit. Then oil went negative. Then oil's back to 40. Then we're fighting declines. Then we're having mergers. How is that planning process even, how do you manage it? He must be pulling his hair out. Yeah. uh, Well, he is an exceptionally good team and he's very, very connected to the assets. And so um, there's a lot of kind of intermediate work that happens inside that subsurface team. And so the exercise of, should we tighten these wells up? Should we loosen these wells up? What if we squeezed in another landing zone? That happens more inside the technical function rather than the VP of planning, which is a little bit more the financial function. What he's looking at is, all right, if we want to grow at 5% or if we want to stay flat or what if we squeezed it down from $800 million to $700 million? What's the result there? And so that's where that exercise really happens. And you start thinking about uh, hedge philosophy. And you start thinking about free cash flow and how that ebbs and flows with, with various commodity prices. Those are the iterations he's constantly running and, um, and, and stays on top of it. We obviously have lots of conversations around maintaining free cash flow. That's first order of business for us. Uh, I think the beautiful thing about our merger with Devon is that that it becomes a free cash flow machine. And that is clearly what we've articulated in the message. Uh, we are a zero to five percent growth company. We are a significant free cash flow generating company. We have a very significant fixed dividend. We've initiated a first time in our industry variable dividend. And those are all kind of sweeteners that um, the combined company will We'll be able to provide and, and 
a very strong finish. It's it's amazing when you're starting to see kind of those the synergies come together and kind of that best of. And we've just only scratched the surface on some of the opportunities uh, around the the opportunities that we see around cost control and, and also well improvement. How has your hedge philosophy changed over the course of your career, but in particular over the last six or seven months? Yeah, so I, I will go back to my time at WPX. I've been here right at six years. And, you know, as you mentioned earlier, we were a, a Piance Basin Rockies natural gas player that had a little bit of oil in the Williston, but we were terrible at it. And we had a few other basins. In fact, we were in, in nine different basins. And not terribly effective at, at, at those basins either. And we made the decision to pivot and pivot away from gas, pivot into oil, pivot away from the peons into the Permian. And those were very significant changes. One of the most significant was that with peons, we had a, we produced about 600 million cubic feet a day at that time. And so anything we measured per BOE, GNA per BOE, LOE per BOE, all these things, and we looked great. And so we had this ability to kind of fool ourselves that, man, we're doing good on cost control. In reality, those BOEs in the peons didn't have any margin to them. And so while as we weren't making money, we were doing it very, very, very fast. <laughs> so we really weren't getting anywhere. We were spinning our tires. As we moved into the Permian, we bought RKI. And in that case, we got very little production with it. We got a huge amount of inventory. And it is the core of what our company is today. But we were severely challenged on a per BOE look. So you look at a GOE, uh, me, GNA, a GNA per barrel, yep. Yeah. Per barrel, all of a sudden, we we're on the high side of everybody, not in the good way. Um, and so we made a very conscientious effort to start thinking about how do we drive down GNA? How do we drive up per barrel metrics? And so what we had to do at that time was significantly outspin to build that production base and really allow ourselves to kind of grow into the scale so that we could generate that cash flow so that we could generate ultimately free cash flow. And that those lines ended up crossing the capital to, to cash flow lines. We planned it. It worked. We crossed those lines in about 2018. And then we've been able to generate free cash ever since. I can tell you with the pullback in commodity price and the pinch on capital, you know, this maintenance capital mode, we could continue to generate free cash flow. But it's, you know, two, three, four hundred million dollars as we roll that thing forward. Um, I think what the investor demands are now, they want significant money. They want to move it in a big way. And this com combination with Devin really allows us to supercharge that. Uh, they were in a strong position. We were in a strong position. You combine it and all of a sudden there is very significant improvement beyond that. I think hedging all the way through as you go back to those days where we're outspending and we could not afford a bobble in the road. We were hedged 80, 90% at times, 100% at times through that period because there was no ability to take on any commodity risk. We couldn't live with the upside. We couldn't live with the downside. We couldn't enjoy the upside because we couldn't live with the downside. I think as we roll forward, uh, especially the scale that we will be, the combined company, I think there'll be more tolerance for uh, living a little bit more commodity risk, a little bit more commodity upside. And so I don't know that we have uh, pre-programmed exactly how we think about a hedging philosophy, but probably more along the lines of, you know, 40 to 60 percent rather than 80 to 90 percent uh, that we were before. Well, I, and I love that answer because I think it speaks to the benefit of scale and mm -hmm. that we've had these small companies and Exxon and Chevron have notoriously never hedged because they're so big, their balance sheets have so much access to capital. And so the scope and scale that people are talking about and maybe some of these synergies should allow companies to be more flexible. So, so last question for you, if you could go back and talk to Clay from 20 years ago, um, so we're just coming out of the, the tech bubble in 99 and you could give yourself some advice that would really impact your career uh, and, and maybe accelerate some of the harder learnings you've had over the last 20 years so that you'd be more effective in a different place, whatever that would be. What would you say to yourself? So it, it's interesting. I, I took a year long leadership class um, about a year and a half ago. And the capstone project of this leadership class was really figure out what's your higher purpose. And as it turns out, after a year of study and trying to figure all this, these things out, 
My purpose, my higher purpose, is to be a conduit, a conduit of wisdom and generosity. I have benefited so much from the mentors that I talked about earlier. You know, just people all around me that have that have been willing to teach, and that goes from you know folks I've I've spent time with in the field to executive ranks in the office wherever along the way. I think um, I think I did pretty well with this, but I would tell my younger self, don't miss an opportunity, a single opportunity to learn. Learn from the people around you. Never underestimate what that person can teach you. Um, bigger company, smaller company, a different role, different education, different background, whatever that is, that person is smarter than you at something. Your job is to figure out what that is and, and benefit from that. And at the same time, don't hoard that information. If you find somebody that can benefit from something that you've learned away, learned along the way, invest in that person. And that's, that's something I, I have a tremendous amount of passion about. And I just love um, spending time with people and, and just being a conduit of that wisdom because it's uh, very rarely do I have original thoughts. Uh, it's usually something I piece together from a myriad of conversations. And um, it's, it's just a tremendous honor to be able to spend time with, you know, some of the folks that I've spent time with and then propagate their wisdom to other people. Well, it's been it's been an honor to spend the last almost hour with you and, and hear about what's going on. Obviously, the industry has known for a long time that consolidation needed to happen. Uh, you guys have been a big part of that, both through the asset acquisitions and now through the merger with Devin. Uh, sounds like you have a very, very exciting 2021 ahead, and I wish you all the best. Thanks for joining us, Clay. Thank you very much, David. Until next time, be safe, be good, have a great day, and bye for now. Thanks for listening.